All right, I want to talk about endometriosis, and here's why. It is continuing to be a diagnosis that's getting missed over and over again in the exam room. I meet women every day, probably just like you, who are suffering with all kinds of symptoms, and at the end of the day, they get a diagnosis of endometriosis after years and years and years of not knowing what's going wrong. All right, in this video, we are going to break down the holistic approach to endometriosis. I'm going to divide it into a couple of parts. We're going to spend part one talking about what is endometriosis, how does it occur, and really getting into some of the science and the testing around it. We're then going to move into part two, which is thinking about it from a different perspective, from sort of this holistic east-west perspective, bringing in Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, to help us understand this disease. And then part three, we're going to build a holistic treatment plan together that really merges together the best of Eastern and Western medicine to tackle endometriosis head on. All right, let's get started. We've got a lot of work to do in this video. Let's talk endometriosis. So here is what it is, in case you have no idea of what I'm talking about. With our uterine lining, when it's in a healthy, happy place, it builds up in the first part of our cycle, but then we nicely shed it on the second part of our cycle as long as we don't get pregnant. In endometriosis, for a variety of reasons, which I'm about to get into, that endometrial tissue or that lining of the uterus overgrows and then actually starts to clamp down on other organs, like your intestines, like the rectal area, your large colon, your ovaries, and more. Now, at first, you may not even notice it. You may have things like heavy periods or painful periods. And over time, it exaggerates. It builds up to where it takes over your life. This can look like excruciating pain with every period, the type of pain where you can't leave the house. It can actually land you in the emergency room thinking you got something surgical going on, like an appendicitis or a gallbladder issue or something of that nature. And Oftentimes, that ER experience ends with, we're not sure what's going on. Or it can feel like pelvic pain, especially pelvic pain around your periods. Having pain with bowel movements is another hallmark and classic sign of endometriosis. Now, typically with endometriosis, women have all kinds of issues, right? Not just the physical symptoms of pain, but their periods might be irregular or absent. They have a lot of trouble getting pregnant. And oftentimes, no matter what they do from a hormone standpoint, there's still no relief. Diagnosing endometriosis becomes incredibly difficult as well. There's not a, a study that can show it to you clearly. An experienced GYN or practitioner can sometimes feel it when they go to do your renal exam. But oftentimes, the diagnostic criteria for endometriosis, which is also equally frustrating, is to do a laparoscopy or a surgery where you have to go in and look physically to see if that endometrial lining is thickened up or if it's spread. And during that surgery, oftentimes everything is cleaned back up, but it's still a surgery and it's still a procedure. Here is what I'm noticing in practice that we can do to start to get educated around, hey, do I have endometriosis or do I not? I like my patients to get pelvic ultrasounds. Here's the reason why. I can look at that uterine lining, and if it's crossed that threshold of six, roughly six to seven, then I know that they are at risk of that thickened endometrial lining or that thickened uterine wall, and they're at higher risk for something like endometriosis. In addition to that, looking at inflammation markers and blood work, I'm talking about a sed rate, a CRP, a TGF beta, a C4A, all of these, if they are elevated, in the context of pelvic pain and a lot of these symptoms we've just talked about, it heightens our suspicion for endometriosis. More recently, doctors have been using the CA125 test, which is typically used to diagnose your risk for ovarian cancer, but we're finding that that CA125 is actually elevated in patients with endometriosis. So again, hard to diagnose, hard to recognize, so many women suffering, still one of the most commonly gaslit, underdiagnosed issues in women's health. But that gives you a framework and a context of what it is, how you might be able to pick up on it, both from a symptom and clinical standpoint, and even from a laboratory and diagnostic imaging standpoint, the most extreme being 
the laparoscopy where you, someone actually goes in to look at all of the tissue. So that's sort of the, what is endometriosis? That's our part one. Now I want to flip gears a little bit and talk about the why. So endometriosis is accompanied by a couple of patterns that we see in practice as Cyrus Spring MD over and over again. For example, we see endometriosis with high inflammation, as we've just discussed. We see it with a hormone pattern called estrogen dominance. This is where the body is holding on to estrogen, storing estrogen. Here's the catch, guys. I don't want you to get confused and fooled. You're going to run out into your labs and you're going to look out and say, I have a normal estradiol level, not me. Here's a catch. You can have a normal estradiol level, but if your estrone level, which is a storage form of estrogen, is high, then you're at risk for endometriosis, especially if you're having all the symptoms and some of the other things that we're talking about there. So we have chronic inflammation, we have estrogen dominance. Now, Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine step into this picture and have something to say. In Chinese medicine, a disease like endometriosis was a disease called blood stasis. Specifically, the blood not moving through the reproductive area the way it should be, not nourishing the organs, not helping them to rebuild, and in essence, triggering this condition of a stagnant uterine lining, one that would not shed completely and leading to stasis or congestion. This idea of blood stasis or blood congestion was usually targeted at the liver. The idea was the liver is not doing its job. It's not moving things through. It's not detoxing. And liver blood stasis is how a Chinese medicine practitioner would treat endometriosis. They would do everything from acupuncture to certain herbal formulas to cupping to get that area to improve in terms of blood flow and the ability to remove that lining to its completion. Ayurvedic medicine, very similar thought. They believed endometriosis was a condition of excess pitta. So story, all this fire, all this fire of the gut, which would then translate to fire of the pelvis, all of it building up, storing this endometrial tissue, which the body would not be able to shed. So when we bring the Eastern approach, we get to think in a broader perspective. Now we're just not thinking what test to do or what diagnostic strategy to use. Now we're actually thinking through, well, what could be causing this? We know there's inflammation. We know there's estrogen dominance. What's driving it? What's underneath all of that? Sure, we could just treat these two arms. And I talk a lot about estrogen dominance in this video and about inflammation in this video right here. So check those out if you want to dive a little bit further into those particular concepts. So what could be driving it? Well, if you start thinking about it in terms of blood stasis or liver congestion, then you start to understand someone's having an issue with detoxification. They're not able to break things down. And where does detoxification come from? It begins with the gut. The liver's a big part of it. So really helping the body in those particular areas makes a tremendous impact. Where else does the liver have issues? Or how else do you have too much fire in the pelvic floor or in the gut if you're going to wear this Ayurvedic medicine hat or this Eastern medicine hat? Well, a lot of stress, high cortisol, getting stressed, not sleeping. These are things that are going to lend itself to a condition of excess fire or liver congestion. So when you put those particular hats on, you widen what we need to do to help manage endometriosis. In addition to that, food was key for both these systems of medicine and for many other Eastern systems of medicine. So a gut that was not moving or had a lot of constipation was a critical factor in managing something like endometriosis. In addition to that, being depleted in key nutrients would hasten or make endometriosis work. And again, the beauty of what I do is we get to see it play out in research and in practice. We know in research that not having enough B vitamins and vitamin C plays into endometriosis and the development of this disease. So again, when we expand what we can do and what we understand about the disease, then we are able to really put together a holistic treatment plan. All right, let's get down to business. Time to pull up our sleeves and build this treatment plan for endometriosis so that you can turn this around. And that's the most exciting news, guys. The earlier you act, the faster you can turn this thing around, right? Now, if it's been years and years and years and you've got tissue everywhere, yes, that might need a surgery. 
but there's so much you can do before you think a surgical option. And here's how we began. Let's start with diet. We really want to make sure we are engaging in a diet high in fiber, high in healthy fats, low in inflammatory and processed foods. What do processed and inflammatory foods do? They put a bigger burden on the gut. They shift the microbiome. Remember all those bacteria swimming in your belly. They shift it to where it can no longer pick up the estrogen, grab it, break it down, and push it out. So we've got to have a healthy gut, and that first begins with a healthy diet. Moving on from a healthy diet, and I talk about an anti-inflammatory diet right here, and we also talk about foods that help to balance endometriosis in my video right here. After diet, thinking about the gut and getting the gut as healthy as possible is an important part of a holistic treatment plan when it comes to endometriosis. This means taking things like digestive enzymes to help break fats down, to help break food down so you can absorb it a little bit better. Adding in a good probiotic that can help the microbiome really pick that estrogen, that excess estrogen right back up and move it through. And then adding in glutamine or collagen to rebuild that gut lining so that we are able to absorb all the nutrients we need. Those are essential pieces of a gut healthy endometriosis plan. And I talk a lot about gut health in this particular video. Check it out if you have a moment, but we're going to keep going as we continue to build this holistic treatment plan. All right, diet, gut health, exercise. One of the fundamental concepts is that we have to get blood flow down to this pelvic floor. And one of the great ways of doing that is to exercise. Whether that's walking briskly 30 minutes a day, doing yoga, doing Pilates, where you open up that pelvic floor, exercise is a very important part of an endometrial treatment plan. So make sure you're accommodating or making some time and space to move throughout your day. Many of us have sitting jobs, which is terrible for the pelvic floor. It's also terrible for just our overall metabolism. But the biggest thing we're doing is we're not getting blood flow down there. So any form of movement where you keep getting up and moving throughout the day is critical. All right, exercise is a big part of it. Moving on from there, there are certain supplements you can take to help with estrogen dominance and to help with inflammation. So adding an omega-3 as a supplement, adding in turmeric as well, which is an anti-inflammatory. And then I love adding in something for the liver, whether it's milk thistle or calcium glucurate and something to break estrogen down like DIM or Meta I3C, which is Indole 3 Carbonyl. That's my supplement plan for endometriosis. But wait, there's more. Again, we want to get the body to relax. So acupuncture and cupping can help again, put the body into a lower cortisol state, improve blood flow through that pelvic floor and really help to turn something like endometriosis around. All right, that's a lot of to-dos. Let's see, we did diet, gut, we talked about supplements you could take. We talked about acupuncture and cupping, even massage I think is helpful. Castor oil packs to that area also help to kind of move blood flow there and keep things moving, getting rid of that pattern of congestion that we were talking about. All of that super, super helpful. But at some point it may be like, hey, do I need hormones or hormone therapy? And that's where I really encourage each of you, especially if endometriosis is something you're suffering with, we have to optimize the thyroid. You may need some extra progesterone to help you shed that endometrial lining completely. And then we have to manage blood sugar and insulin because the more we can keep blood sugar nice and stable, then in turn, we bring inflammation down. So that's my toolbox. There's so much more we could talk about, but that is the quickest toolbox I could give you when it comes to holistically managing endometriosis and being able to put all the pieces of this back together. All right, I've noticed new videos every week. Don't forget to like and subscribe.